Welcome to this podcast created by Newcastle University Business School, or NURBS for short. The Oxford Dictionary states that the nub of something is the central or essential point of a situation or problem. So we hope that in this series we can help you to get to the nubs of it. This podcast series looks at a key theme of value, the value of our creative economy, the value of our student experience, the value of our research, the value of our collaborative networks. In this series, you will meet academics, alumni, students, graduates, and professional staff of Newcastle University Business School as they talk about what value means to them. In this episode, join your host, Ashley King, as she speaks with Janine Anthony, Dan Ellis, and Louisa Rogers about the value of creative economy. Janine is a current student studying her Master's in Business Administration and MBA at Newcastle University Business School. Dan is the co-founder of Jam Jar Cinema, and Louisa is the creative director of Studio Courtenay, as well as Trendlister. Hi Janine, how are you? I'm very well, happy to be here, or not to be here with a celebrity. <laughs> I am so excited to have you here because I know that you have so much experience in radio broadcast journalism and I always wanted to be a journalist uh, journalist from very young so I'm actually I feel like a bit of a fan girl um it's I'm intimidated and and just delighted to have you here. Yeah, your dreams are still valid, you know. There are a couple of rules maybe maybe you can still live your dreams. <laughs> I think uh, I'm I am very fortunate that I get to do wonderful projects like this yeah. in my activities at Newcastle University Business School. I would love to know um, about you and what can what can listeners learn about you and your experience, your background. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Okay, um, I'm Janine from Nigeria. I'm I've been a journalist for journalist producer present depending on the hat you want me to wear <laughs> for about a decade now I started quite young and I started because I didn't value myself to know that I had that talent I had to have people who said Janine you you can do sports you've always talked really well about it you can do sports broadcasting but I didn't think I wanted to do that because I wanted to play football professionally but my my dad stopped me from doing that so I kind of like ended that dream and then when people could hear me talk about it they just really pushed me to do it and supported me to do it I felt a bit like a fish out of water because you know I didn't say a lot of women doing that so I was like you know it would be strange can I compete will I be good enough um it just took one opportunity. The rest has been history. I started a women's football website for African women's football and African women footballers. I started in Africa and then from there ended up working with the BBC. I became the first um, African female commentator at a major men's tournament, which was the Africa Cup of Nations. Um, and yes, just been breaking the, the ceilings ever since. And now I'm doing another one. I'm taking up another challenge in doing my MBA which I have no idea about how business runs. I'm passionate about startups, but not in any idea about how it runs. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about this journey. Yeah. Excellent. Gosh, I have so many questions for you already. And we're both chat boxes. So this is, <laughs> this is the, the fun part. Um, but I want to know, first of all, you know, I'm so interested in your all of what you said about your dreams and about wanting to be a... Um, a, a sports commentator and being a journalist in that way, but also feeling like worried about um, being the only woman doing that. I'm interested, what kind of response did you get when you started commentating on those things? I really thought I wouldn't go there because I didn't believe I could do it. And you know, the thing about women is when you get into a position, you carry the, the, you know, you carry the hopes and dreams of millions, billions of women right on your back. I was like, if I mess this up, they're going to say the whole woman race can't commentate. Um, and it wasn't perfect at the start, but I, I think I sailed through it and I, and I inspired other women to do it. And then even watching the Euros a few weeks ago and having Emma Hayes absolutely boss it on Twitter. She was trending. Women can do it. And I'm happy that I, I got my chance to. 
I love that. I love your passion and your enthusiasm. And I'm just really delighted for you as well. And just to hear how other women are taking up the mantle, going out there and spreading their message and hearing, uh, using their voice to be heard. I think that's really powerful. Um, and so you also mentioned that you are studying an MBA. Can I ask how that's going for you? So, um, being a creative and then going <laughs> in and learning from a very, it's typically very corporate, very business orientated. How are you finding it? I always throw this joke around. Like I knew where all my loose change was in the house, all my pennies, my pounds. When it came to finance and accounting, I was like, what is this income statement about? What's this balance sheet about? I don't understand. I know where my money is. I don't know. I need to put it in a chart or something. Um, and that's just the difference. Um, and I thought I was coming to learn something completely different which means i have to start from the ground up i've actually found out that there's really similarities to this um in terms of being a creative one of the biggest things creatives um are quite known for is they don't really value themselves they could do things for free for as long as possible um and they don't understand some of them don't understand the business behind their brand and what they do they don't understand the demand and the supply aspect of it but coming to do an mba uh, means that there is a lot of difference there's a lot of similarities rather businesses now are getting in touch with their end users and consumers who are always almost visually drawn to the products on social media. And that's where you have a lot of creatives there and um, who ensure that, you know, that products, businesses, what they're selling appeals to new consumers, different markets, different uh, target markets as well, and different, um, you know, uh, customers. Um, and then there's a huge and beautiful fusion. Um, and I've seen that come through in a lot of case competitions. I've done how in the end, I'm like, oh, if we just marketed this, this here with this form, then you get a new a, a new set of uh, customers and it absolutely worked. And yeah, so I've realized that there's a good fusion between creativity, the creative industry and the creative economy, and of course, core corporate business as well. I love what you're saying because it seems to me that although you were scared at first about being a very creative person studying in that way, actually you're bringing a lot to the table. You know, compared to your peers who may think in a very similar way, you are dynamic and different. And then, you know, for instance, like you've said, when you're running and being part of case competitions, you're able to influence things. And, and actually, am I right in saying that you've actually won a couple? Yeah. I've, I've, um, some some tasks, yeah, some competitions. Um, I've come close a couple of times. Okay. However, I always say the fact that I'm here and did it, I won. Yeah, absolutely. I 100% won. agree, <laughs> for sure. And I think sometimes when we fight our own doubts, yeah. it, it, for me, when I did my MBA, it was all about the fact that, gosh, I... I really had to look at every part of my identity that I'd had and it shook everything up and then see what was left. You know, it really forces a mirror on you and it's an incredible year, but very, very scary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about what it's like. So you spoke about the creative economy. You spoke about valuing it. You spoke about how creatives don't value themselves. Do you think there's any differences between the way... Uh, creatives in Nigeria work to the UK. Have you had the chance to network or meet many people here? Yeah, it's, it's vastly different um, and similar um, at the same time. There's the passion across board. There is the need to, to sh shine a light on their intellectual property, um, ideation, generation of ideas, sharing of that, that content. And that's the fantastic thing about what social media has done in the sense that I learned many things that's happening in the UK even while I was in Nigeria and West Africa and, and, and vice versa. However, it, it's um, the difference is the enabling environment. Um, because in, in Nigeria, being a creative meant you didn't really do well in school. And, you know, I don't know how much the education system plays a role in that, but you are the backbencher. You are the one who's got to get your life sorted. And um, you don't get as, you don't even get that cocoon of support in your home. How much more, you know, in the economy itself, there aren't structures. Nollywood is the Nigerian movie industry. 
It actually is the second biggest movie industry in the world behind Bollywood, which is the Indian movie industry, um, as well as um, well, it's ahead of Hollywood. That industry grew on its back but didn't get the enabling environment in terms of structure, funding, investment, um, you know, support um, uh, from it. I also have to mention the fact that um, Nigeria at the moment is undergoing a Twitter ban. Every hour that Nigerian creatives are not on Twitter, they lose $250,000 for every hour. And this has been since June. So you can see how the environment is completely different from here in the UK, where, you know, um, it's completely supported. You have the Department for Media, Arts, Culture, Sports. You see all of that. We don't quite have that in Nigeria. So it's vastly different. And that's why you see in business, entrepreneurship, innovation has really worked there um, 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 for, for young people um, as against what you've seen there. So it's vastly different, but it's still, still the same passion that runs through. Really. Absolutely. So it doesn't have the quite the structures that you'd you'd hope for and that might embed it in culture very interesting to hear your experiences as a child um and uh, i've got two more questions i want to ask you the, the the last one i wanted to check is you mentioned you know you've got this passion for sport At the same time you see yourself as creative and you are a creative you produce content you make things you report on it you talk about it so you've got a lot of broad skills um, do you ever find that there is a stigma or not necessarily stigma, but there is an idea that people who are creative don't like sport or people who like sport aren't creative? Or do you find those types of stereotypes as well? Um, no, um, maybe especially from Nigeria where um, the... I mean, I think the BFFs in the industries are probably like creatives and sports people. Like they really align um, because they... they it's a very symbiotic relationship. It's not parasitic in any way. They benefit from each other, um, you know. Um, so there is there is no stereotype because they really understand each other. They work in tandem and they understand how the business, the industry is cutthroat, how the bravest, the talented, the hardworking, the smart workers will survive everything thrown at you. They do understand that. Now, the problem is, is the general wider society that can stereotype to say, because, um, so because I'm doing sports, or because Jenny is doing sports, it means I don't know mathematics, you know, or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not versed in biology. And I literally just said symbiotic. I was showing off my biology in a way, <laughs> symbiotic and parasitic relationships. So it's the wider society, I, I, I would say, um, um, hasn't quite um, the government basically, because they have the, the, the power to really make it more inclusive. I'm just going to throw an, you know, a stat out there. The orange economy, which is what it's called in Latin America and, and the Caribbean, which is also the creative economy, film, arts, craft, you know, graphics design, you name it, part of the, even research and development is part of the creative economy. Now, in, 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 in 2015, um, the Inter-American Development Bank said that it provided over 1.5 million jobs in Latin America and, and the Caribbean, which is more than what a country like Uruguay or Costa Rica would produce in a year. Um, that's how important those economies took and those governments took that economy. And I think if, if governments can tap into it, especially for developing and underdeveloped countries, um, especially now with the pandemic, you'll be unlocking a lot of potentials and it could really, really rejig and really revive the global economy. I love that. I, f I find it such a really exciting way of looking at things and so different as well. You know, it's it's a beautiful way to think that if we had the support systems in place, we can actually make meaningful change and contribute to our, our economy globally, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. Thank you. I have one final question. If I can ask you in one word to uh, tell us what you, you would, what word you would use to say about Newcastle University Business School, what would you say? You, you don't mean one sentence. <laughs> one word, one word. I think it's magical, magical. That's, it's been magical for me, really. Stuff of dreams. Just, yeah. Just doing this and being here. I would say it's it's magical because it's making my dreams come true, really. So yeah, that's the word magical. That's beautiful. I feel it was magical for me too. So let's go with magical. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in, Janine. Hi, Louisa. So great to see you. Hi, lovely to be here. 
So I am very delighted to have the opportunity to interview you because you are someone I've been wanting to talk to for a very long time. And we have met before, uh, actually, because you are one of our very engaged Newcastle University Business School alumni who uh, very often, you know, dedicates her time and energy to um, supporting the university with various guest lectures, networks, mentoring. I know you've done a lot uh, to stay connected with the school, which is really lovely. Um, but we're actually talking today about your fabulous creative uh, experience and your businesses. So I would love it if you could share with us uh, and the audience a little bit more about who you are and what do you do? So hi everyone, my name is Louisa Rogers, as you've just heard, and I run two fashion businesses at the moment. One is slightly newer than the other. The other I've been doing since I graduated, although it's kind of gone through a few different phases of evolution. And I also lecture at Northumbria University on fashion communication. And I have indeed lectured on the arts, business and creativity program um, for a couple of semesters. So that was really fun kind of getting to go back and actually teaching on the course that I did, um, as well as doing a year at University of Sunderland. So I've pretty much done all of the unis um, in the area as well. But fashion is really the kind of thread that pulls everything together. That and this idea of sustainability, this idea of kind of slowing down the trend cycle um, and kind of encouraging people to think differently about how they dress. Absolutely. And fashion's an interesting one because as a recent MBA student myself, we do a lot of case studies about brands like Zara or H&M or many brands across the world. Um, and I think this is quite standard for MBA's uh, courses that you do look at case studies around the fashion industry and fast fashion. And one of the things that I've always liked about Trendlister, particularly during the pandemic, you actually uh, were very innovative at a time where many creatives would have been panicking. Uh, and you may have been panicking, there may have been times <laughs> like that, but you actually launched an entirely new product line. You, you created masks very quickly. Um, it was even before people were buying masks, um, material masks, you know, you were uh, making them out of um, beautiful vintage fabrics. And so I was so inspired by that at the time. And I'd like to know a little bit of, about for you, you know, at a time of such change, how did you come up with such a brilliant idea? I mean, it was kind of, I can't really take full credit for it. Um, I work very closely with a tailor called Ali from Afghanistan, and uh, we're very, very close friends. We ended up adopting some cats together. It's a very modern kind of co-parenting relationship. And, um, you know, throughout those first few weeks, few months of lockdown, when things felt like a ghost town in Newcastle city center, you know, I would still go in every day to my office and bless him, Ali would be there. He couldn't open to the public, but he would just come in just to get out of the flat, have a change of scenery, and he would go to his shop and kind of busy himself with different things. And, you know, we would sometimes get breakfast um, or, you know, go and fetch each other coffees. And we were having a conversation and, you know, he was saying, have you seen that they're saying that, you know, we might have to wear masks and they might make it mandatory and blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, well, do you think we could make masks? And he said, yeah, I think that would be a great idea. You know, he said, I, I think I know how I could do it with some straps. And I had this whole load of fabric because I think in the back of my mind, I've always wanted to be a fashion designer, but I didn't study fashion design. I have no technical ability. You know, I'm really very much on the side of styling it and then talking about it and selling it, but I could not make an item of clothing. I can't even sew a button on. And uh, I had all this fabric that I had just bought because I loved the prints and, you know, vintage fabrics are just so unusual and vibrant. And I thought, hey, maybe we can finally put some of these to good use. So we made some prototypes, put them out there. Um, and eventually what we did was we sort of donated 50, you know, first come, first serve. We were just sending them out um, for about a month to anyone that wanted them. And then we started to kind of put them on the website and sell them. And, you know, people could request bespoke ones if they wanted specific colorways. So it was just kind of something that came to us quite early on. And 
it was funny because we then ended up kind of playing around with the designs. You know, the first one was like you had to tie them at the back. And then eventually now we've got one with sort of elastic bands. We did ones with air filters. So it was really funny. It was almost like this whole design and development process. Um, and, you know, it's just funny to think how ubiquitous the mask has become, you know. And in those early days, we were sort of seeing it as this novelty. And, you know, over a year in, here we are. Uh, exactly. And we are we are still wearing them. So I think and we will be wearing them for a while. So I, I actually think that was very ahead of the curve for both you and Ali to, to do that at the time and a great way to respond to some of the challenges uh, for creatives right now. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is about the power of collaboration and collaborative networks. And you've just spoke about that there so well in terms of, you know, having friends you can lean on and work together and bounce ideas off and do things together. And one of my questions for you is, would you say in your uh, experience as a creative business, how valuable have networks been for you? Really, really valuable. Um, I think especially being in the Northeast, you know, it is quite a sort of highly interwoven community of people, you know, which is really nice, particularly from an entrepreneurial perspective, because you always get a sense that there's going to be someone out there that can help. And if they can't help you directly, they will be able to refer you to someone that can. I think collaboration is so important and collaboration goes beyond networking. You know, it's sort of networking made tangible. That's where you can actually start to do projects together. Um, you know, I met one girl because she had this sort of brand herself where she was experimenting with this idea of sustainability, but she was making very specific products and we got talking and I loved what she did. And then eventually she said, well, are you looking for a maker, you know, for these sorts of products? And I sort of said, well, yeah, what, why don't you give it a go and, you know, throw some together. And we looked at some designs and she's actually taken on now a significant part of our making, you know, in terms of accessories. And we're actually now experimenting with homeware. So we're putting our amazing vintage fabrics and our offcuts into um, sort of cushion covers, um, you know, lampshades, things like that. So that's all kind of to come. So that's, uh, that's exciting. I think it's really important in terms of resilience as well. So one of the things that I made a big effort to do during the lockdown was to kind of be a part of online programs. So a p and &E Pioneers program. That's kind of a local initiative to join people up with mentors. That's been really helpful. Um, and I also did a sort of accelerator course at the Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And that was just really good because that kind of gets you out of your own headspace, you know, gives you a place to talk ideas. When you're just going day to day and you're not really seeing anyone else, you can really quickly start to lose perspective. And sometimes you just need a third pair of eyes you know, to come in an external person to say, have you tried this? Or that's great. Why don't you do that? So I've really tried to, even when we've been very isolated physically, to kind of maintain those open networks and open connections in a virtual sense, even though it's not quite the same, but you know. But it's also about attitude and, and what you've shown there as well is the resilience to adapt, try new things, give yourself some forgiveness as well when things don't work, but also ask for help, which is so important. Um, also in lockdown, you actually launched a second business, am I right? Yes. So Why did I do that? I don't know. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I believe it's called Studio Courtenay, is that correct? Yes, that is perfect pronunciation. I, I always want to call it House of Courtenay. And so <laughs> that's why I had to check because um, there is, am I correct, there is a famous family or a French uh, legacy. Um, so when I when I first heard it, I was really excited by the name and I think it's beautiful. I love the typeface. You can tell I like a um, good font. Um, <laughs> but would you like to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, so the name itself actually comes from my family. So my great grandmother was a Courtenay. Um, and if you kind of trace it back, we were 
connected to that French family. So that's that's quite cool. So there's a bit of history. Um, you know, my my more recent name, Rogers, just doesn't have as much of a fashionable sheen to it. You've got to go French, really, for fashion. Um, so that's where we came up with the name. But essentially, we had been doing vintage for quite some time. So we've been operating under Trendlister. You know, it's been great. We've been kind of building up a customer base and, you know, really starting to focus in on what we're doing, which is European designers and amazing prints. And we just got to a point where we felt like we had taken it as far as we could. You know, we're a small team, we're like maximum four people. Um, and there was just a sense that we needed something new that we could start to really kind of brand as our own. Um, because vintage is so eclectic and that's the beauty of it and that's why I like it but it does make it very difficult to get that consistency and that messaging right it's very much about what product do you have in at the time whereas we thought well if we have our own range then we can start to really create a story around that you know and just slowly start to build up that collection so we're not doing big seasonal launches we're literally drip feeding as and when seeing what works what people like what they don't like you know what fabrics work best for what and we're just going slow and steady because we're self-funded you know we use the proceeds from the vintage to invest in and fund this new venture and you know we're just going to see where it goes and if it works fantastic and if it doesn't then we've learned a lot along the way and you know we've done no harm um and hopefully been at least a kind of voice and a bit of representation for a more sustainable slow fashion approach in the region absolutely and you've done a little bit of uh actually you said you've done no harm there but actually in many cases you've done more good because <laughs> you have been repurposing fabric using uh you know leftovers um repurposing pieces trying new things um it's really exciting actually to hear all, all of that and it's funny because when i first heard of fashion or thought of fashion i never thought of the connection with sustainability so i wonder if you'd like to say a couple of of words i, I know you lecture on this already but why it became so important for you to you know um to or when did you become interested in the the journey of you know uh, something that we buy and then how it's it's lifetime you know um the thing about vintage we know that if you buy something from a charity shop or from a vintage fair it usually has some wonderful material with its own secrets and memories and that's what i love about vintage but i'm curious about about your journey with slow fashion you know what was it that made you start to wake up to the um the the journey that our clothes go through so I think I probably will arrogantly class myself as an early adopter of slow fashion. Um, my family, we only ever shopped secondhand. So you wanted to buy something, it was charity shop or car boot sale. Um, and that was just the way that we did it. I didn't think there was anything weird about that. You know, that was just normal. Like, of course, I'm waking up at six in the morning on a Saturday to go and stand in a muddy field and you know, barter with old Belgian men about, you know, a dress, no, five euros, no, two euros, you know, aren't you going to haggle? Um, so yeah, so I found that very normal. And what I loved about it was, you know, I always liked to dress really quirky and different. We didn't have a school uniform in Belgium. So, you know, we got to do that during the week, which was nice. And, um, you know, I, I was always just wearing secondhand. You know, occasionally I'd get something in the sales on the high street, but it was just a different way of consuming. And so I think because I grew up with that, it was very normal to me. And then that's kind of what actually got me into selling vintage because what happened was, you know, I went to university in London, um, couldn't get a part-time job because I hadn't really had a part-time job at school because I was doing freelance photography and I needed to make some cash. So I started selling off my surplus clothes that were a lot of them vintage. So there seemed to be demand for them. You know, I was popping them on eBay and very quickly started realizing that there was demand for it. And then it got to the point where I would go out and look for things specifically to buy and sell online. And so that kind of remained my little side gig, you know, throughout my university years. Um, and then when I came out the other side of it, that's where I thought, well, maybe there's something in this to actually make a business out of it. Um, I've always loved about secondhand clothing, about vintage clothing, that you're just more likely to be the only one in the room 
wearing it. it it's so unique you know yes a lot of it was also handmade out of really high quality fabrics so there is a sense of like craftsmanship you know and like you say they last a lot longer but ultimately it's also just about having something different and something unique you know and not worrying about you're wearing the it dress from zara but you know you get on the bus and two other people they're wearing the same thing so i think it was it was always something that I did in terms of buying clothes. And then I always loved the distinctiveness of the design. So it was a combination of both of those things that kind of drew me into sustainability. Um, and I, I just, it never crossed my mind to make overseas with the new collection with Studio Courtenay because I actually wanted to be involved in the process. Because as I said, I don't have a design background. So, you know, by making in the Northeast, I can go, I can sit with the manufacturer. They can tell me about what they're doing. No, that won't work. That will work. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to send documents off and get clothes back eight weeks later. That just didn't interest me. I love that because you've almost um, had various iterations of uh, Trendlister and also your masks as they were new iterations, but also discovered for yourself which parts of the business you want to learn more about and how you want to grow as a leader and change and adapt. And um, I do love that you have two businesses, you a guest lecturer from different universities, as well as continuing, you know, all kinds of your own interests and finding beautiful clothes that no one else has. So um, I want to ask one more question uh, just around the creative industry in general. So, um, you know, it can be challenging for people wanting to get started in the creative industries, um, especially right now at the moment with limited funding. And you've mentioned a couple of times about uh, self-funding a lot of things, you know, investing, reinvesting money back into things. And you can see that right from the beginning with your first purchase, uh, sorry, first sale of your own clothing mm -hmm. um, and then discovering that there was actually a gap to do that and there was a demand for it. I'm just curious about, um, if you had any tips for new uh, new people wanting to start out in the creative space, what would you tell them if you could go back or tell yourself? So I, I think I would tell them to bear in mind that the creative industry is still an industry, you know, so it's, I feel very, very lucky and privileged to be able to do, you know, work that I find inspiring and interesting and stimulating every day. But of course, there's always a level of you have to make money and you know there's a bottom line and there are excel spreadsheets to be filled out and you know there are taxes to file and i think sometimes because of the nature of creative work uh, people can be quite resistant to that but what i would also say is you know you don't have to compromise everything you know you can do 70 percent what inspires you and you just put up with the other 30% because that's what you need to do to make it viable. You know, I think a lot of creatives will um, create amazing work, but then perhaps they will not have the impetus or sometimes even the desire to then go out there and showcase it. And I, I think that's natural and, and normal in a way because it, it is difficult, but it's very much about getting outside of your comfort zone. It's about focusing on what priorities you have. You know, if your priorities are flexibility, you know, creative stimulation, then make sure that you're saying yes to opportunities that are going to align with that. And, you know, yeah, there'll be times that you try things and they don't work. But a lot of the time, I think you would surprise yourself with what can transpire. You know, I hated public speaking when I was at university. I said yes to an opportunity through a not-for-profit that I was working with and um, the head of fashion at Northumbria was in the audience and came up to me afterwards and said, basically, would you like a job? So, you know, that was something that never would have happened had I not put myself out there. And yeah, it's stressful and it's unpleasant, but the payoff can be huge. So it is an industry, there are compromises involved, but ultimately, that compromise is, is worth making if it means that you can make that your livelihood, I think. Absolutely, I love that. Um, I did hear a rumor that um, you have been nominated for an award, so I would like to hear uh, a little bit about that, but also what's next for Louisa? 
So uh, I've been nominated, thank you very much NatWest, for the Great British Entrepreneur Awards uh, for the Northeast region. I'm a shortlisted finalist or semi-finalist um, in the categories of sustainability and fashion and beauty. So that's really exciting and it's nice to get that sort of badge of, of recognition, you know, from a, a big business like NatWest. Um, so we'll see what happens. I was nominated a couple of years ago and, you know, we did lose out to to one of the new dragons, um, Sarah, who's absolutely lovely, by the way. So it was very well deserved as a win. So we'll see what happens with that. But in any case, it's it's really nice to get that recognition. Um, what's next for me? You know, I hope that Studio Courtney will continue to grow. I would like to take it outside of the region when things start to open up, um, you know, bring it to different parts of the country. We've got a few events sort of scheduled in the future that I think will be really beneficial for that. And just building up that range and trying to work out, you know, what is it that people want from sustainable fashion? I want to very much run with this idea that sustainable fashion doesn't have to mean hemp. It doesn't have to mean, you know, black and white and beige. It can be colorful. It can be a bit mad. You know, it can have that really fun vintage look to it, but also be ethically made. So I guess we're kind of fighting back against this idea that ethical has to mean minimal. So we're just more is more. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love the eccentricity and exuberance and flamboyance that all of that you've just said um, <laughs> brings up for me. So I'm very excited about uh, the future for Trendlister, but also the studio Courtenay and you. Uh, Louisa's future too. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to ask the final question, which is what in one word would you say to describe your your um, your time with Newcastle University Business School or how you feel about the business school? I mean, oh, one word. If I could give it a sentence, I would say probably one of the best things I've ever done. If I could say one word, I would say catalyst. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's a very good word. I like that. We've actually got a fabulous new building called the Catalyst. Have you have you been in yet? No, I did not know that was happening. Uh, okay, <laughs> I would highly recommend when you are able to and when things are open that uh, you check out the the new building, the Catalyst. It is uh, really quite something. I'll be and sure to do that. Yeah, and hopefully we'll see you speak in there one day. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. We're globally connected. The Business School alumni community spans five continents and 142 countries. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. Pleasure to be here. So, Dan, you are uh, the director and founder of Jam Jar Cinema, and that's correct. Yes, Dan and Whitley Bay. Okay, so can you tell listeners who maybe have never heard about Jam Jar Cinema yet, but will now, um, a little bit about how it started, uh, what you do there, and uh, how it's going for you. Um, so I came and did a master's at Newcastle University, and to support myself through it, I was working a fairly miserable job at a local theatre, scanning tickets on the front door. And the number of people who kind of came in going, oh, is this not a cinema anymore? And it used to be kind of that mixed arts venue. Um, and I kind of thought, well, okay, there's obviously a want and demand for a cinema in this town. Um, and part of my course was to kind of come up and create a business plan for a potential creative business. So as kind of really weirdly kind of my di dissertation come kind of studies, I ended up kind of dreaming up what a cinema could look like, what it could operate like, and a lot of research while I was actually uh, studying as to how that might operate. And then randomly, I just kind of made it happen in a very kind of abridged way. So um, we opened a jam jar cinema in a derelict old bookmakers, a, uh, a derelict job center above the bookmakers, should I say, uh, in Whitley Bay in 2013. And it was a one screen venue. Um, we did all right for quite a while. We lied, begged, borrow, stole, were voluntary and then became staffed. Um, and we spent about three years trying to get an adjacent building. So in 2019, we took that building on. And just before uh, the lockdown for COVID, we'd signed off and we've now got three screens. Um, so we show all the latest films as well as kind of independent specialized content. We have an education program. We do a lot of outreach and um, community fundraising work. And yeah, so it's a real mix. We show the best of kind of 
independent British and Hollywood titles, and then we have a World Cinema Strand as well. So it's normally seven days a week, um, and it's a real kind of flag bearer for our town. I think it's absolutely incredible for anyone listening and for for, for me just to see. Um, you had a dream and you've grown it so much uh, despite challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic, but also funding challenges, which is a key issue we're talking about today. You know, valuing the creative economy. What does the creative economy mean? And, you know, how do we value our creatives? So, I mean, the fact that you've had an idea, you've gone and done a course and, and sure it's been part of uh, the development in the course that you've you've developed that idea, but to actually go and make that happen. But now, you know, have multiple screens running running seven days a week, have staffed, uh, you know, teams. That's really something. So I'm I'm actually really inspired by you. And I know that many of our listeners will be. Um, I would like to know, what was that journey like for you? So growing that business from, you know, a tiny derelict studio, as you said, did you have to do lots of scrubbing and algo? elbow grease and it was hell yeah yeah and, yeah, was... and mop buckets and all the do. things yeah um no so yeah that's really interesting um so you've touched on do we value our kind of creatives no we don't do we support them um at face value i think um and a lot of that support is via kind of larger organizations but in terms of kind of direct support we're pretty poor here in the northeast um, I think that's mostly set from central government as well as kind of through a variety of arts organizations. But it's only seems when you're kind of established in May that there's regular support and funding there. So actually as a new person coming in, it's terrifying, it's lonely, it's scary. Um, and everything that you've just described, we beg, borrow and stole to get the money to start the place. We thought, oh yeah, we'll build a cinema on like 20 grand. And we went to start up loans and said, can we have a 10 grand loan? They were like, yeah, but you need to get it match funded. So we said, oh, no, we have. The council are giving us a 10 grand grant. So then we went to the council and said, oh, we've got a 10 grand loan if you match fund it. And that's kind of how we started. But £20,000 does nothing. It, um, we didn't realise you needed a certain standard of equipment to show films. Um, we just kind of started just, we just going deep, to be honest with you. And like scary deep. But it, I'm in a different, very different position in my life now as to 10 years ago when my exact line was, I can't afford to buy a house in Whitley Bay. It doesn't matter if I go bankrupt. And I find it really tragic that the only way that I was able to start um, a career in the creative industries was that premise of, do you know what, if I go bust, it doesn't really matter because it becomes a class issue. It becomes actually about who can afford to do this. I moved back in with my family. I um, worked three jobs on top of kind of setting this off. Um, so yeah, it's really tough and really challenging. I think as well what you've said there about the the hustle. You know, we can sometimes glamorize hustle culture, but also sometimes it is the the real the real um, way that things get done, and it's the only way that it happens is through pushing yourself through it and against the odds because. Uh, many people start businesses and not everyone actually keeps them running for such a long time as yours has and to actually grow it even further and, and start to become more self-sufficient. So I think that's really important what you've said there about wanting to, you know, work really hard and make use of networks. And, you know, sometimes your negotiation is that you need to get one piece of match funding and then another piece and match them together. But how did you keep yourself sane at that time so you know what kind of strategies can creatives who are maybe recent graduates wanting to start out in their own creative journey or even for uh, more established folk who have their own creative businesses but maybe are going through the bankruptcy phase where they're thinking you know what I don't know how to do this what am I going to do how can they keep themselves uh psychologically safe um that's not the right word i mean you know what well, kind of tips did you use yeah. yeah um so i think it's really important um at times i wasn't 
is the big thing. And I used to refer to them as grey days of it's just miserable and you don't want to talk to anyone and you're really ratty and angry with your friends. But I think it's about kind of trying to tap into as many networks as you can and not in that really showy networking type way where you're forcing business cards down people's throats. Just going for a coffee, going for a walk, having a chat with a pal and also someone who might not be necessarily in the same sector as you. Um, people talk a lot about the value of mentors. Um, I think mentors in the creative sector are useless because most people are kind of free spirited and they'll do their own thing. Um, but actually having friends who can empathize, understand, and are kind of doing very similar things in different fields has been a really useful resource for me. Um, being able to kind of just get a bit of perspective. It's not all that it's, it's cracked up to be. It's not the most important thing. It's a job. If you go bust, you go bust. If you make millions, well done for you. Um, it's about kind of realizing what your own goals are, keeping those in perspective. And I always remember everyone kind of starts out with kind of, yeah, write yourself a business plan, that'll help. And then you never look at it again. My business plan mission statement was, I want a minimum wage job in the arts. Because at the time there was no jobs. I, I started just after the last kind of recession, financial crash. And it's very similar. I'm seeing the same echoes as we saw then. Those kind of jobs are not there. We're seeing kind of inflation in academia, in jobs, people who are massively overqualified. Post pandemic, people are changing their careers now and going into different things. And um, so my attitude, if there isn't a job that I take, make one. And um, the worst that you can happen is fail. You might get laughed at. Your friends might kind of take the mick out of you at the pub. But in real terms, that's it. I absolutely love that way of thinking about if there isn't a job for you, make one. Because what you've said there about the echoes of the past recessions and also, you know, for yourself when you were when you were graduating and also, you know, the the expected economic challenges we may have coming up um already have especially in the creative sector um i think that it, that is something that it's really important for us to talk about um some of the discussions that we've had in this series so far as well has been around things like how in the creative industries and the cultural industries um there is a lot of the idea of hope work and working for the idea of hopefully getting something out of it and at the same time, uh, you wouldn't have been able to launch your cinema without that as well, you know, without volunteers helping you, without yep. you, you know, leaning on friends. And, and so it is, it is, um, it's challenging because in some places it has a place and it is about collaboration over competition. And then in other ways, could there be more structural support? Could there be more policy or um, ways to make it easier to start a business in the arts. And you touched on class before, and I'm just curious about your thoughts around this, especially around the concept of exposure, working for exposure, volunteering. Um, what, what are your thoughts there around what could be done to support artists and creatives more? Um, so we have a lot of great organizations in the Northeast who run very successful internship programs, paid internship programs as well. We have hundreds of graduates coming out from kind of our universities and colleges here. People, um, this, but for me, there's a real disjoint between unless you want to go into that institutional kind of mindset or working for an organization for a given job, or um, it's a big step then to set yourself up as self-employed, to have that confidence to say, this is what I'm doing. And I think there's some real structural support that needs to happen to get people to go, right, okay, I want to set myself off as a videographer, or a copywriter, an artist, or um, how do I do it? Where do I go? And the specialized support just isn't there at the moment. We have a lot of kind of uh, business support in terms of kind of like for startups and uh, freelancers. But I think the support targeting creatives people who are working within the arts economy especially um it's just not there they don't get it they don't understand the same challenges and in real terms as, as i mentioned earlier kind of the advice to always lean on a mentor those people don't have time because the one thing that someone who's working within the creative economy values above all is their time 
And I think what we need is some almost guide on fairness. I see people who either massively undervalue their time or give it away free or expect others to give it to them. You've talked about the hope economy of, oh yeah, the number of times I see the word exposure. Um, and the flip side of that is, or people value themselves and go, yeah, I'm 500 pound a day. I'm 300 pound a day. No one actually knows, uh, talks about fairness. And I think that's a real difficult thing to tackle and needs a lot of people in the same room. And at the moment, that's just not happening here. It's really uh, interesting your points there, because what I would like to know is now that you are established and you have been running your business for some time and you are one of the few um, cinemas locally in the northeast of England that does offer not only your standard, you know, Hollywood type films, but also a world program as well as independent films. So I'm curious about, um, you know, are you finding that as you've become more established, you are now becoming someone that people seek out to talk about some of these issues? So are you able to use your voice to speak on behalf of other creatives? But at the same time, I guess my, my question there is as well, is who's, whose responsibility is it to fight for cr the creative industries? And that that is something, you know, is it something that as a society we should collectively value or is there a... Uh, you know, is, is it something that someone should lead on from a policy perspective? Have you got any thoughts around that? Um, yep, I think that very much boils down to money. And um, we're caught in a very uncomfortable position of being that the arts or creative economy have a social good, that they are good for towns, they are good for people's well-being, they are good things. But the converse of that is they're caught between money cost what, what's that good worth why should i support that good and um, in terms of being seek, sought out yeah for especially with regards to kind of film cinema um luckily the uk has a great cinema association so most kind of cinema operators and owners work closely together and i i think that model could be replicated across different sectors i think within the northeast it's quite disjointed and it comes from some people are doing quite well other people are really struggling and there's only so much work there's a real kind and there's a competitive competitive element up here as well um but i think the northeast is a fantastic place if you wanted to start something because everything's so cheap like if you want to get a half decent building and turn it into a studio, you're paying five, 600 quid a month. Whereas if you try doing that in Salford or London, you're paying four times the price. Um, you might not get anywhere near as much work automatically or from this, but if you want to put your toe in the water, it's a great place to start. Absolutely. And also that friendliness of the network locally and the collaboration opportunities as well, I think can be really helpful for starting something. Um, it's, it's really interesting what you said there about being sought out in some ways, because I think um, it's just so nice to see your journey of how you have uh, grown something from nothing. And now, uh, you know, you have the opportunities to feed into to key issues. Um, so I guess I'd like to know if you have any top tips for anyone who you've already shared, um, you know, how to keep yourself sane in tricky times. But, you know, um, how how can people... Um, uh, I, guess, I guess my question here is, um, in terms of that hope economy and things like that, how do you deal with those questions now? Because you have shared that there is a bit of a, a bit of a contradiction between the, you know, the, oh, I'm, I'm this much a day and the also undervaluing yourself. So maybe you could share your points about how you value your time and, and energy and, and where you put that. Um, okay, so yeah, I work from a real baseline of if I can pay my mortgage, if I can pay all my bills, put food on the table and have a bit of spendies at the end of the month, I'm pretty happy. Uh, and I think if everyone kind of starts at that point or how they get there. And I mean, when I first started, I used to, I didn't get paid for three years. I used to make 20 quid on a Friday uh, out the till to go to the pub with. I couldn't afford to go to the dentist. It was that kind of level. Now, um, even the pandemics hurt my business, um, as it will have a lot of kind of hospitality, leisure and creative companies. 
Um, we were forecasting for 2020 to have between 80 and 100,000 visitors. We had 14 staff. We've lost some staff. Um, realistically, we think that we won't get back to where we were until 2023 now. Um, but I'm going to show you what, I'll distill a master's degree in uh, kind of two minutes. Please do. I would love that. Um, so yeah, I did arts, business and creativity. And my takeaways from that, and this is the uh, kind of all I remember 10 years down the line, is if you kind of get someone's money, get their time. And it's a really hard thing for someone if you ask them, can you help me? As humans, you kind of want to say yes. So if you just say to someone, look, can you help us? You'll either get a really honest response, response from someone going, do you know what? I just haven't really got the time, but have a look at this or the tend to signpost you to something that might be useful. Or they might just say yes. And the other bit that kind of was how to grow a business and everyone's like, well, and this could be anyone, whether you're kind of just starting out, I still kind of govern our business by this. Um, the only way you can grow is get more people spending with you, get more people spending more with you, get them to come more often or cut your costs. And so long as you can get more people coming, spending more, or spending, increasing how often they spend with you. They're the hard things to do, but actually you're always gonna have like a baseline cost. Um, and we kind of run with that. We also have the fifth one, which for us, we're a social enterprise. So for us, um, which I haven't really mentioned, the big thing about Whitley Bay was it used to be an old stag and hen town. Um, it was kind of really sad when we opened. Um, we were the first real business to be the flag, we were, refer were referred to as the flag bearer in that we changed the nighttime economy. No one else had invested into um, what was a dying pub and club scene. And now we have a very vibrant culture of pubs, restaurants, microbreweries. Um, it's a really diverse, it's a mint night out, um, but it's a different night out and different proposition. Um, so we are kind of fifth governed one is, is it right? So when we look at things like, is this right for us? Is it right by our kind of morals? Is it right by our ethics? Would people like us to do that? What's the potential reputational blowback if we go against it? And I think if people do things fairly for the right reasons, then they cannot really go wrong. And if they go wrong, it might just be that they're unlucky or it might be that they're a bit rubbish. I think that's um, some very sage advice, especially the the series of tips there, the way that you, your framework for making decisions and your governance is really interesting. And I'm actually going to make sure that in our show notes, we we list those five top tips yeah. um, so that people can, can use a little checklist for themselves if they're working in the creative industries. I also want to say I've never actually had a night out in Whitley Bay, or I may have been to a wedding on a hotel once, but I am going to check it out in a hurry. And uh, now that it's I know yeah, what yeah. a good night out is, I, I do like a microbrewery. Um, and I love the idea of supporting local and small independent businesses as well, which is really lovely. Um, okay. So the, the only thing that I wanted to ask you just as a, a final thing is Newcastle University Business School, you are an alumnus of the business school. You studied there. You've gone on to use your degree. You've also very kindly, you know, come along here today and you stay connected with the school in lots of ways. Do you still work with or stay connected with your alumni network? Have you um, found any benefit in networking with other um, people who were maybe on your course with you? Um, so from that, those programs, um, you know, is there anyone that you were able to grow alongside so not necessarily what you said about mentoring but those networks did you yeah, stay connected um, with anyone do you know what it's it's fab uh, fantastic Our, my course um was very international yeah. so a lot of people have kind of gone back home and are doing really interesting things in their own communities um there was one other local student he lives about three streets away from me so we kind of keep in touch i keep an eye on what kind of she's doing and she's still working with kind of creative enterprise which is amazing um in terms of kind of hooking up with other kind of graduates not really be and that's purely based on like the kind of kind of graduates and alumni coming out 
Um, we probably do, but we pay for the services. So we pay for kind of our accountancy. We pay for our, our legals. We have our own marketing person. And then we outsource marketing to different kind of companies. So there's probably a lot of nubs out there. Uh, we just don't really know about it. Yeah. Um, but in terms of kind of direct link up, um, it's really weird for us because we probably have closer links to kind of like music courses, filmmaking, literature, um, and a lot of kind of like our education outreach community work has more of a reach across the university and universities and colleges in that respect. Um, we are so proud to be f based in the Northeast, from the Northeast. Um, I think it's a mint place to live. It's a mint place to work. It's lush up here. And I just hope that we retain talent um, post pandemic. We can, I hate the term build back better, but build back differently and finding new ways to solve old problems. Um, and I think a lot of people are starting to reevaluate the why, the how, the what they really want from their careers, their lives. Um, and I think there's some really, really exciting opportunities on the horizon. Absolutely. Gosh, I'm so inspired talking to you and I love hearing the Geordie, uh, <laughs> Geordie's uh, slang. Uh, lots of great words there. So my last question was just, uh, if you could describe Newcastle University Business School in one word, what it means to you, what would you say? Um, do you know what? It was confidence. Because for me, I came, I trained at drama school and making that transition from kind of London conservatoire training into someone who ha felt that they had the skills and knowledge to run their own business and like run a business that run a couple of, to be honest with you, run a couple of businesses. We're now branching out into doing some theatre work. We're looking at kind of some arts investment as well. So um, that's a really um, interesting thing, but I would say it gave me the confidence to actually kind of go, yeah, do you know what? I've got a couple of letters after my name and that's great. But actually internally being able to say, yeah, I can do this. Absolutely. I love that. And uh, yeah, I hope that anyone listening as well feels inspired by that too. Uh, I know just what you mean about confidence. I felt the same doing a master's. And I think there is something about a master's that helps you feel equipped to tackle lots of the the challenges coming your way um, and gives you a new set of skills and frameworks. So, um, but yeah, that, that's all we'll have time for today. So thank you so much no worries, for joining thank you for us. Thank me. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can drop us a line at nubspodcast at newcastle.ac.uk. And you can also tag us in any of our Newcastle University Business School social media channels. You can find these links in our show notes. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share with your friends. This podcast has been brought to you by Newcastle University Business School. Your host has been Ashley King with executive production by Ashley King. Photography by Paul Scorer of That Branding Company and Blind Sea Photo. Production by Alice Smith and Tim Lozinski at TL Multimedia Limited.